Um, our speaker, our special speaker. And so here is Irene, our program chairman, who will... To, oh, I have to pass this around. I didn't do it. I have to. I'm going to walk it around. I have to have information. Okay, I'm really excited today. Our speaker this morning is not new to the world of exposing the truth in undercover operations. Christian Hartsock has a long history as the chief investigative reporter for Project Veritas, where he recruited, trained, and mentored undercover journalists. He also worked with Andrew Breitbart up until his death and also with Steve Bannon. He has worked diligently to uncover the truth of journalism. Christian grew up in Oakland. He earned his BA in film and video production from Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara, and he now resides in Los Angeles. I warmly welcome Christian to speak to us today on the rise and fall of Project Veritas. For those of you who were here yesterday, uh, don't worry, the, the speech is going to be a little different than yesterday, uh, but it's going to start the same, including with this joke. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, you guys know the, the remember the Groucho Marx line in Annie Hall, where he says, I would never want to belong to a club that would have me as a member. Yeah. Uh, that's why I love the Republican Women's Club. <laughs> I'm the Pied Piper. I can't do it all by myself. Every time I go to a tea party or an event like this, I say, okay, guess what? You're anointed. You're in. You're now, everyone here, <laughs> Katie Kurt, everyone here is now a journalist. They're now competing with you for the next job. That's what's happening. If they're not going to report the truth, if they're not going to report the true American narrative, then we're going to do it, and we're going to supplant every network, every anchor, every reporter, and we're going to put them all and banish them on current TV. That's what we're going to do. One by one, we're going to fill up current TV. It's just going to be a network of freaks. The other mode... Christian, say hi to the Nixon Library. Oh yeah, hold on, let me just, I don't know why I'm doing this here. Hey, say hi. Hello. Hello, this is Christian Hartsock. Christian, are you a citizen journalist? Yes, I am. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And what are you doing right now? the propaganda and the coordination of the Democrat media complex against the American people? And how much money am I paying you to do this? That's a great business model. I love America. Christian, I'm going to call you after my speech. These people love you. They blew a prop. Through James O'Keefe, we're social networking our way into their brains and freaking them out. And it's not just about exposing them, it's not about getting in their faces and saying to Richard Trunka, bring it on. Bring it on. There are more of us than there are of you. Bring it on. All right. Um, can we get the lights, the lights back up? <clears throat> So, oh, yeah. So, Andrew Breitbart 
inspired a movement of citizen journalists, including myself. Uh, two months from now uh, will be the 60th anniversary of the single greatest act of citizen journalism in American history. Now, every single mainstream media outlet was present at Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. But it was a hat salesman by the name of Abraham Zabruder who got the real scoop <clears throat> with his eight millimeter camera. Now, that eight millimeter camera, that eight millimeter footage sat under lock and key in a vault of Time Life magazine for several years and was not seen by the public until it was seen in a, in a New Orleans courthouse eight years later. It's kind of a funny thing, the way the corporate media always has a way of stifling some more candid citizen journalism. But it's a citizen journalism that when it's seen, changes the way the public perceives the course of human events. Now, who remembers that episode of Seinfeld, The Red Dot? Oh, yeah. 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 So, Elaine gets George a, uh, a job, and to show his gratitude, George uh, tries to give her a gift present, goes to a department store, he sees this beautiful, expensive-looking cashmere sweater, but it's marked down by a lot. It's like, you know, marked down 70%. And he asks the department store lady, why, why is this cashmere sweater so cheap? And she says, oh, because that is that, and there's a red dot on the sleeve. There's like, ah, oh, she'll never, she'll never notice. <laughs> <laughs> so he buys it, gives it to her, she freaks out, she's like, get out! She, she, she loves it, she can't believe he got her such an expensive gift. And, and then Kramer pops up from the couch and says, what's that red dot there? <laughs> <laughs> Citizen journalists are always looking for the red dot. Andrew Breitbart saw red dots everywhere. The corporate media, the government media complex produces a 26 uh, volume Warren Commission report that you know, gives everyone peace of mind about what happened on November 22nd. But District Attorney uh, Garrison sees the Zabruder film. What's that red dot there? It's all about the red dot. It's all about finding what is, what is the corporate media leaving out? What are they leaving on the cutting room floor? Uh, my time with one of my favorite memories with Andrew Breitbart. Now by this time, I had already been working with, with James O'Keefe uh, I worked with, and, and Hannah Giles, I, I produced the interstitial footage uh, in Acorn, and the Acorn videos, interstitial footage of Hannah Giles pretending to be a prostitute as she went to the Acorn offices, pretending to have, uh, to, to want tax advice to set up a brothel for 14-year-old Salvadoran sex slaves, and that's, that's of course the video that uh, President and former ACORN attorney Barack Obama was forced to sign legislation defunding ACORN over those videotapes. Now, I've been working with James uh, in particular over that time, but I was also working with Andrew Breitbart. Um, although, I, wherever I would go, Andrew would kind of, I would run into Andrew. It was, it was, it was very serendipitous. The first few, couple of years of working with Andrew Breitbart were by chance. Um, if you guys remember, uh, in uh, 2011, 14 Democrat legislators disappeared from the Wisconsin uh, Capitol because uh, they wanted to deny Governor Walker a quorum to pass his budget repair bill. And of course, buses and buses of, of protesters, of grassroots protesters, came out of Chicago into Madison, Wisconsin, and encircled the Capitol. Before there was Antifa, there was Occupy Wall Street, and uh, in, in um, uh, Madison, it was Occupy Madison, and you had all these occupiers occupying the Capitol. It was almost like, you'd almost maybe call it an insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the way the press was reporting it is, oh, these teachers, these brave teachers and union workers standing up to, to this union buster, Scott Walker. I wondered what the red dot was. What did they have in mind 
what do these occupiers really have in mind? I went there, Andrew Breitbart happened to be there. He and I had the same, have, were the same mind we both, there was this group of doctors outside during the protests, handing out, distributing sick notes uh, to anyone so they could, to teachers or anyone who had to miss work to, to you know, and all this, so I went up, and this was back in the day, you could have a handheld camcorder and just a friendly countenance and it's, to elicit someone. You didn't need so much the undercover button cameras and purse cameras. And I said, you know, I'm from California and I'm not used to this weather. My legs are a little numb. He's like, I'm concerned about that. I'd like, to, I'd like you to take the day off. And he gives me a sick note. Well, that trick, and Andrew Breitbart happened to do the same exact thing. And this is, so we kind of put, packaged our stories together and it triggered uh, an investigation by the uh, UW Medical Board into uh, medical fraud. <laughs> and um, around that same time, I went into the Capitol one night and wondering what the red dot is. The red dot was what do they want to replace? Because a lot of the signs were, were really against capitalism. Uh, that, that was the rhetoric coming out of Occupy. And I, I wondered what, what is the red dot? What do they want to replace it with? So I talked to this kid, Rob Lewis, who was one of the occupiers, real friendly kid. And um, <clears throat> And I asked him, so what's this all about? Why are you here? And he said, well, the capitalists are trying to take away from the workers. And I said, okay, um, give me an example in your life. And he says, well, I work at a, a restaurant called Noodles. And it's basically like a dictatorship. <laughs> I said, okay, well, using, so, so how is it like, you know, using Noodles as a microcosm of the system that we're here to protest, how is it allows Noodles like a dictatorship? And he goes, well, you have to show up. <laughs> You're told what to cook and when to cook it. And if you don't do it right, you might be fired. And I said, oh, well. Uh, so what is you guys' proposal? What, you know, how would you use it, keeping in mind noodles as a, as a microcosm, how would your noodles look like if you were in charge of noodles? He said, well, the workers would be in charge, and we would decide. We would decide what to cook and when to cook it. <laughs> and I said, "Okay, well, what about the founder of Noodles?" And he said, "Well, he would be, be invited to a seat at the table." <laughs> Great. That's a, you know, it's inclusive. It's nice. Um, I looked up the, new, the Noodles founder, this guy called um, Aaron Kennedy. Who was who had grown up on a farm? He had he had uh, maxed out all he had. He wrote he was at a Chinese food restaurant one time, and, and he had an idea for a bit. Wrote his business plan on a napkin, maxed out all his credit cards, uh, maxed out you know sacrificed you know risked his relationships with friends and family to borrow money, and created noodles. And by that time, noodles had was employing about thirty thousand workers, just like. Rob Lewis. So I released the footage. It ended up on uh, Breitbart.com. It ended up on Glenn Beck. And um, Glenn Beck covered it actually very well. And um, people, were or people were horrified. People were like, oh, so this is what they have in mind. The budget repair bill passed, by the way. Um, and uh, you know, the fact is, these, these, these ideas are 200-year-old ideas. Rob, Rob Lewis, 20-year-old Rob Lewis didn't come up with them. I had infiltrated the, the UW Madison, um, the, the Communist, the International Socialism Conference. That's, that's kind of where I started hearing these ideas. What did they want to replace this with? As Heather Booth said of the SDS, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. Now, fast forward a few years. Uh, I've been, you know, Andrew Breitbart dies unexpectedly. I was the last to see him in the office the night he died. Um, it was very shocking. Um, Hannah Giles kind of disappeared, um, but James O'Keefe founded Project Veritas. We no longer had our leader. James O'Keefe created Project Veritas um, and recruits undercover, an army of undercover journalists to expose the truth. James was no longer going undercover because of his public profile, but people like me and uh, a group of elite undercover reporters produced the content, the undercover stories that you've been seeing the last 10 years for Project Veritas. Um, most of the reporters, you'll never know their names, but they're the ones who delivered the stories that, uh, that you've seen. I'll tell you about one story, and then I'm gonna move to Q&A. 
Um, <clears throat> so Google, this is the, the year is 2019, and Google, uh, we had an insider from Google, Jason Voorhees, Zach Voorhees, sorry, Zach Voorhees, um, came, came to us. He was an insider in Google, and he had these documents about Google's machine learning fairness program. And the machine learning fairness program is like you, you know, it, it uh, manipulated search results. So if you if you um, Googled, you know, famous inventors, there would not be, you know, on Google Image, all the inventors would be inventors of color. You wouldn't see any. You wouldn't see Benjamin Franklin. You wouldn't see, you know, any of, you know, any of the many of the inventors that we know about. Um, we, uh, you know, you Googled CEO. Be all women CEOs. Not that not that women are, don't make great CEOs. With, with one big exception, in the last six months. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but so we were just wondering. Okay, whatever. But we're wondering: is there a political? Um, is there a political utility to this? Are they manipulating search? Are they trying to manipulate reality um, ahead of the 2020 election? So we had an idea. So so uh, Tom O'Hara, the CFO, um, he came up with an idea. It wasn't his idea, but he. But I remember him saying at HQ, "We need to find out who the person behind the curtain is." And so um, so I Googled it. <laughs> Who's the head of machine learning fairness at Google? And it was uh, Jen Janai, an Irish uh, an Irish American woman in San Francisco, um, who was, had a public profile. So I said, "Okay." Hmm. Uh, we came up with uh, how, how do we get to her so I can ask her this question. So what we did was uh, we created a fake charity called Two Step Solutions. Um, and I emailed uh, Jen Janai and I said, Miss Janai, you're a very successful, inspiring woman in tech. We uh, have a program where we're pairing young girls of color with uh, inspiring, successful women, women uh, in tech as mentors. It's a mentor program, see? And uh, because you know the tech boom has number it's 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 a reparative just it's a reparative justice thing because the tech boom you have to admit Jen has 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 pushed a lot of you know communities of color into the excerpts. Also, number two, um, you know there's this fallacy that tech is a is a boys game that we want to we you know we want to uh, break that and, and get young girls of color interested in tech. Early on, she's like, "Ooh, ooh, this is lovely. I love, I love to be a part of this." So we, we, so so she said, "But can we meet by Zoom first? I can't do Irish. <laughs> uh, and so 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 we go up to San Francisco. We rent a, I think, a WeWork space or something, and just do spend the entire morning and day like set designing the backdrop. So for the so it looks like we're in an office, and we we have and we we. Um, I, you know, I meet with her over Zoom, and it looks like we're busy, you know, and I say, okay, now, uh, she's like, okay, it's great to, great to meet you, and I say, okay, um, now we need to meet you in person because there's kids involved, and we, we have to vet the mentors, you know, you understand. She's like, oh, absolutely, and we, by this time, we had looked on her Instagram to see what her check-ins were, and one of them was this cantina in San Francisco, so I suggested that cantina. She was like, oh, I, I love that cantina. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? No, I so, 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 so I meet her the next night. How's tomorrow? I, I take her out to dinner the next, the next night. Um, and uh, order, you know, she orders a tequila. She'd just gotten back from a, a vacation. I ask her all about it. I get her in the mindset that she's still on vacation, so she's not committed, you know. And, um, and, uh, and I say, all right, look, I got to be honest with you. And this is small talk. What happened in 2016? You, you, who dropped the ball? How did all that Russian disinformation get on the internet? And what are you guys gonna do about it in 2020? She's like, oh, don't worry. We're, we, we are working overtime to prevent another Trump situation. <laughs> and utilizing machine learning fairness. So, bingo. So, you know, we released the tape, um, and YouTube, owned by Google, bans the tape, yanks it off. I don't know why. why. <laughs> um, but um, but by the time they did that, Donald Trump Jr. had already copied the embed code of the video and tweeted it. So it ended up being one of our most viral videotapes. <laughs> that day of the release. <laughs> the day of the release, um, you know, Donald uh, President Trump was in the Oval Office and there was a press gaggle battering probably about Russia Gate or whatever. 
And he's like, no, 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 no. We're not going to talk. We're, today we're going to talk about this video on the, on the internet this, from Project Veritas about how they're trying to manipulate the election. And so he forced them all to report it. That same week, Ted Cruz, there was a, there, the Google executives, there was a hearing in the, both the House and the Senate of Google executives. Ted Cruz is reading a transcript of my dinner with Jen Janai to the faces of Google executives, demanding they explain it. Dan Crenshaw did the same exact thing on the House floor. So that's that red dot. That's how we, those, are the, those, are the, those are the links we go to to find, to, to find the red dots. Confirming suspicions, uh, that's our business. And we did it for 14 years, and it was the undercover journalists and the insiders and the producers, the people, the unsung heroes that made Project Veritas what it was that kept it going, that, that kept the content coming out. Um, and we're good. And now it's all over. Oh, we don't work together. Why? <laughs> Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it will continue in, in one form or another, um, because and the red dots are all over the place. What forms? Hmm? What forms or another? So we'll meet, move to the Q and A right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this perfect timing because I wanted to. Cause I, cause that was, well, yeah, I mean, are you going to have your own company? Are you going to go to work with James O'Keefe? Are you going to? What's going to happen? We need you. Yes, yeah, thank need you. you. Yeah, well, we're figuring it all out. We're all we're all out of a job that, as of the last few weeks, but we're we're figuring it out. Um, and you know, but you're still yeah. smiling. What's that? You're still smiling. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm coming. And you, and, you, and you know why? Because I see there's still a demand for this sort of thing. Absolutely. You know, and nature abhors a vacuum. As long as there is a demand. See, before Andrew Breitbart, before Project Veritas, you know, curiosity is a must. <laughs> Curiosity is a muscle, and the mass media has a way of numbing that muscle in the public consciousness. They shame curiosity. They're anti curious You know, a, a journalist in true form is supposed to be a human mimesis of the collective curiosities of the public. What, what do they do? They discourage curiosity. Why are you asking about the vaccine? Why are you asking about bears? Why are you asking about side effects? Why are you asking what we do? What do you want to know about that? What do you, some kind of, you know, whatever, fill in the blank? Um, but where they're, where, where, and, and to the point where people are ashamed, they keep their curiosities to themselves. They closet their curiosities. Well, pro, in, you know, Project Veritas, what we did is, while all the mainstream corporate reporters are acting as stenographers, they're lining up to, you know, as Andrew Breitbart said, the 38th blogger on the bus who also really wants that 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 uh, that five minute meeting with with Mitt, or interview with Mitt Romney, you know, the corporate media lines up to copy and paste the talking points of the anointed politicians uh, they're protecting, and to act as as hitmen for the unanointed. What we did at Project Veritas, with the art of seduction and mastery of disguises, we could proverbially walk through walls into the smoke filled back rooms and find out what the power players really thought. And we knew how to ask, and we knew how to get the answers. And because of that, we, we, we were able to confirm or dispel suspicions that were instinctual to smart, critically thinking Americans. Um, and in this room, I obviously sense there's a demand for that to keep on going. So I promise you this will take another form in one way or another. Um, I'll yes. That. What, what, so, my young one, what happened to Project Veritas? Yeah. Where, you need to repeat the questions because we can't hear them. People want to know. I don't know the story. Is it, there's no more Project Veritas? No more Project Veritas. Well, <laughs> technically, there is a Project Veritas. Technically, the 501c3 exists. Hannah, uh, Why? What happened? What happened? Our, our new CEO, um, who I had a hand in recruiting, thought it was a brilliant idea. Um, <clears throat> Hannah Giles, the, the, who played the prostitute in the Acorn tapes, um, you know, James decided to leave earlier this year and create his own competing organization while still an employee at Project Veritas, um, which was very unfortunate. Um, so he was he was out of the picture, 
and Project Veritas need it. But, and we, but, but here's the thing, and this is something I really, really want you guys to know about. The last six months, from February to August, was the, and I've been with the Veritas since before it was Project Veritas, since before, it, since when it was Veritas Visuals, Visuals, the, the Garage Band days. 2009 Acorn to a few weeks ago. Um, to the, by the way, to the week, down to the week, it was late August that we did Acorn. Uh, well, James O'Keefe did Acorn, I just did the interstitial, but uh, it was to the week anyway. But the last six months is the most vividly I've ever witnessed resilience and determination and moral courage. The journalists are, you know, people don't realize this because the conservative movement and the conservative influencers, the popular con conservative influencers didn't, they, they, they ignored the stories because they didn't, because they didn't have James O'Keefe introducing them. But we exposed in the last six months, our undercover investigative journalists and our producers and our editors, we produced story after story after story. It was one of the most consistent, um, uh, consistent, you know, uh, periods of content pro production that we've ever had in Project Veritas. We had exposed groomers in schools, after school programs. We exposed literal pedophiles wow. and, the, and, the, and the websites that they were, that, that they were, that they were using. We exposed uh, Mayor Adams and his scheme, you know, busing migrants to Westchester County. We exposed uh, crony capitalism. We exposed, you know, no bid contracts. Uh, we, expo we exposed, you know, story after story after story. Unfortunately, a lot of these stories didn't get the same traction that we had gotten that we had gotten before because you didn't have the Tim Pools, you know, um, retweeting them. And it seemed like there was a certain contingent in our core, former audience that uh, claimed to be supporters of Project Veritas, but were more interested in the celebrity of our founder than the content of our undercover investigations that our undercover, unsung, unknown, unnamed uh, undercover journalists have been producing for the last 14 years. So there's a problem in the conservative movement. Um, the conser you know, there, and that problem is largely human nature. Um, there's a certain reminiscence of the um, celebrity worship and the cult of personality and the group think um, that we see uh, hegemonically on on the Obama left. There's, there's a, on a smaller scale that exists in the conservative movement, unfortunately, and you know, the journalists kept on working. It was the first time that we were hated by the right as much as by the left. We're used to, we're used to, we've had our, you know, our journalists have had their doors broken down by the FBI. We've been deposed, I've been deposed multiple times, um, and we've been attacked left and right. We've been called racist, we've been called everything uh, by the left, but this was a new thing where the right people that we thought were our friends were going after us just for continuing to do our jobs. Um, so unfortunately, so we thought it was a good idea to, to, to recruit Hannah because the mantra was, you know, people were saying, you need a face, you need a face. Okay, but what about the videos? Are you guys, not you guys, but, but to, our audience, to this contingent of our audience, we were wondering, well, aren't you guys fans of us for our undercover videos, for our undercover, for exposing corruption? That's what we're still doing. Um, yeah, but you need a face. You need a face. Okay, so we uh, we recruited Hannah Giles because the mantra was no James O'Keefe, no Project Veritas. Okay, well, guess what? If there was no Hannah Giles, there would be no James O'Keefe, right? So we thought it was a brilliant optical jujitsu move. Unfortunately, Hannah Giles um, did not uh, assimilate to the culture of PV. She wanted to colonize it. She boxed out some of our very most important members. Our, our, uh, she boxed out Matt Tiermond, our, our, uh, one of our board, board members. She boxed out um, our CFO and our, you know, I could get more into detail, but long story short, she, I think, saw an opportunity that was not in line with, what, what, with the reason she was being given preemptively the trust of a, of, of a team that had been wounded and that was fragile and, very, and had every reason to be selective about who they trusted. They gave her our trust, and she abused it. Um, and uh, and she, you know, 
she got rid of most, she got rid of the entire production department of a video production company. She got rid of the entire journalist leadership of a journalism company and kept a few people behind to make donor calls, God knows what for. So Project Veritas technically still exists as a 501c3, maybe that's, I don't know. Um, maybe she wants to repurpose it for something else. I have no idea, um, but Project Veritas is no longer. It's unfortunate because the journalists that were making Project Veritas, Project Veritas, and the producers and the editors, um, they were all still there. And we had a fighting chance. After James abandoned us, we had a fighting chance to keep it going. We kept the stories coming. But because of that, that aspect of the conservative movement, yeah, but you need a face, you need a face, you need a face. And unfortunately, the face that we got didn't, you know, we, we got a face, but, uh, you know, heart, soul, and mind were sold separately. Um, Can we still say, do something? What is the thing that they say? Be brave, do something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we still say that? Um, uh, yes, yes. I mean, demand it. Well, well, you know, there's a lot of disinformation out there about what happened with Project Veritas. Um, and correct people when you know when people say, "Oh, the board of directors was bought out by Pfizer." It's not true. Yeah, I mean that's a popular popular narrative that you know a lot of people have been have been you know, which I think is as asinine as Russia Gate personally, <laughs> um, because you know when we released that Pfizer that Pfizer story about mutating viruses and a directed evolution, which was humongous. You know, our, uh, our board member, Matt Tierman, our board member, was one of the loudest promoters of that story. He said he called it the greatest story in the history of Western journalism. Uh, but the narrative was that, you know, James kind of sowed the seed of this narrative after, you know, he was the board intervened to, to you know, ask him to abide by existing guardrails. Um, the, the narrative was that Matt Tierman must have been bought out by Pfizer, and that's why he ousted James. James was not ousted. He was not ousted. He chose to leave. It's kind of a complicated story. story. I've lost track of what happened to James O'Keefe. So, okay, so here's what happened. What was the question? Uh, what, happened what happened with James O'Keefe? Well, the people in the back didn't oh, hear that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What happened with James O'Keefe? Um, so look, let me preface this by saying there is not a single person that has been more loyal, remains to be more loyal to James O'Keefe than me, who's not blood related to him. I've been with him the longest. I've been working with him since 2009, and um, you know, in the early days, we had we had our fights, and I had sometimes legitimate reason to walk away, but I didn't. You know, uh, I'm a Scorpio. We're fiercely loyal. Um, and I, this was something that no one else was doing. This, this trade crap that James O'Keefe had pioneered, no one else was doing it. Project Veritas was the only organization doing it. Um, so I, I still consider myself loyal to him and loyal to the mission. But sometimes, as Andrew Breitbart used to tell me, as Andrew Breitbart used to tell me about this very issue, sometimes loyalty means the opposite of enabling. Um, so James O'Keefe, uh, there was some. Uh, there was a pattern, um, there was an audit that was released, you, you're welcome to look at it. There was uh, a, a pattern of spending, a pattern of employee treatment that was concerning. Um, and the CFO, Tom O'Hara, told James, like, look, we, we, we can't keep doing this, um, re you know, having you have to reimburse the company for using the company card on personal annuerment. James fired him. Um, well, the CFO is board appointed, and the CEO cannot fire unilaterally the CFO. James said he had a board buy-in, but when the COO followed up with that alleged board buy-in, that board member said, I didn't approve firing Tom, so it turned out that was not the case, and James unilaterally fired the CFO. The CFO was restored. There were also complaints about the way James was treating staff, and the board, um, who, each of whom, if you saw what Kathy, Kathy Holkle did with the NRA, she went after the lawyers. Look, the board members of 501c3, a charitable organization, uh, are personally liable for financial malfeasance and for employee treatments. It's illegal to operate a hostile workforce. Um, so um, the board in, uh, sat down James, had an emergency board meeting, said, James, we love you. We love you. Uh, we, we, we want you to stay at this organization. We want you to remain the leader of this organization. You have to abide by existing guardrails 
and you have to treat people better. Um, and they had employees test testify for what the problems were because they had, you know, they had tried to get through them. But and Andrew Breitbart warned me about this sort of thing happening one day. He warned me about the yes men, the sick of fans. And he himself had been boxed out at, at times uh, for, for not being a yes man. Um, someone, someone uh, leaked, and I believe I, I, I believe I know who it was. Someone leaked, leaked, because it was not true, leaked to um, Tim Pool that James had been ousted from Project Veritas. Tim Pool, who obviously is motivated to, to be a friend of James and have James on his show for clicks, um, he went forward with that narrative and um, that created a groundswell of conservative Twitter knee-jerk reactionism making a martyr out of James, repeating the mantra enough times that it became true in Goebbels' fashion that James had been ousted by Project Veritas. Oh, the interesting timing, it was one week after the Pfizer release. So that became, a, that, you know, James was not ousted. He was still an employee as late as May 15th. This happened in February, but, but James has this videotape of himself on President's Day during his uh, two-week leave of absence to go into the Project Veritas. Now, I can tell you, I, you know, I, along with the entire staff, practically was laid off three weeks ago. I don't think my key card into HQ would work if I went to try to get back in the building. So I don't know how he got back in the building if, in fact, his key, his, his key, his, his, if, 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 in fact, he was fired as he claimed to be. Um, but he gave that speech and about how he had been ousted and that he was going to pick up his toys and go somewhere else. And that's what he did. And you know, inter interview after interview, there was the same innuendo that he had been ousted, and that and um, that Pfizer probably had something to do with it. Uh, and you know, every single one of us journalists who who committed to this cause because of the disinformation in the corporate media, you know, breaking apart the the the, the group think enabled. Um, Conspiracy theories, Russia Gate, uh, the disinformation about COVID. This is this is what we committed to this organization to stand against: is disinformation, propaganda, and 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 um, and partisan groupthink. But that's what we were up against. Um, so that's what happened. I mean, the, the the board did temporarily suspend him from hiring and firing in order to protect employees from retaliation who had testified. Um, and they did temporarily uh, freeze his credit card because they needed to con uh, conduct a financial audit. We're a 501, we were a 501c3 and the IRS had every, you know, was look, always looking for reasons to shut us down because of what we were doing. We had to, we, <laughs> We, the board wanted to quietly, internally uh, sort this stuff out, balance the books, and for James to remain CEO, um, but make sure that all that everything is in order, that all money that had been spent on personal inurement was all donor money that had been spent on personal inurement, helicopter rides, um, you know, um, uh, trips to visit, visit his girlfriend that all of that had been paid back to the 501c3 so that we wouldn't get shut down by the IRS. Um, James, I guess, saw an opportunity after that leak to uh, make a martyr out of himself, but no one wanted him gone. I can't stress that enough, no one wanted him gone. Are there any more questions? Yeah. All right, we'll take two. Do you recognize someone if you're from now? Um, well, I mean, I can give you, uh, off the top of my head, I, uh, I, I love Dan Bongino. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I love Peter Schweitzer. I love, um, you know, that, um, but, you know, undercover journalism, we're, you know, I, we've got a whole diaspora, Project Veritas diaspora, looking for a new home, and hopefully you'll see us again. Uh, and, you know, so, so. Uh -huh. you have a question? Hi, um, I'm under the impression that there are extremely powerful technology 
technologies in existence that are kept secret from the public and are essentially suppressed. Um, technologies might include things like weather, weather engineering or perhaps water fuel and thermal combustion engines. My question for you is, would you ever consider doing a story about live streaming from start to finish with perhaps zero edits, the construction of such contraptions to encourage viewers to build such contraptions they see being built before their very eyes. So the question was, <laughs> technology <laughs> that has been um, hidden from the market. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand the military is always 15 years ahead of the market on technology, and, and right now they have technology we won't hear about in 15 years. Um, how the technology is being utilized, that's the kind of thing that we tried to expose at Project Veritas, whether it was um, Google machine learning fairness, whether it was, um, whether it was you know, the vaccines, um, and bioweaponry uh, that, you know, I, I guess uh, the yeah, live that's streaming, the that's live very streaming so that so viewers can figure out how to build the contraptions they see being built before their very eyes, they can build it for themselves because it's live streaming, no, no edits, would you ever consider doing an expose so that viewers can like just build this up in their own garage? Yeah, I'm not much of a technology person. I'm kind of what, what, what millennials call a boomer when it comes to technology. Oh. <laughs> Do you go under disguise when you go out? Because people would recognize you. Yeah, these people are very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> They're, they, you know, uh, they tend to be the most self-absorbed people. Yes. Yeah. They um, don't watch Fox News. They don't want, you know, yeah. so that, that certainly helps. But yeah, I mean, your shelf life as an undercover journalist um, uh, you know, has a certain limit. You know, I, I, in the last few years, I couldn't do long-term embedding because people would, because you, you can look me up on Project Veritas Disposed. Or, right. Anyway, but yeah, I mean, it's all about, you know, one of the rules that James put in the original rules of Project Veritas is your manner matters as much as your costume, in fact, more. So there's a way to just get people, there are all kinds of techniques um, to get people. I heard that you compliment them and then they'll open up and yes, they yes, yes. brag on what they that's exactly right. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. Okay, good. All right, well, thanks, thank guys, you. for listening. That was great. We're really glad you came. And if you think somehow we can help you, you let us know. You be in touch, and we will, and we will help you. And we're going to pass the hat for anybody who would like to contribute a little money to help him on his way. Um, anyway, I'm really glad you came. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, we do miss that. And I love that saying, who thought that up? Be brave, do something. I think that might, I, 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 I don't know. It might have been James O'Keefe. Uh, might have been you. Have, yeah. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> but we don't know. Well, anyway, we're very glad you came. And I have all these back, and I'll try to do something with it, and I'll be in touch. And that. see if Carl can come and help us do our phoning. And please, please, please take that sheet tonight, that little sheet of numbers, yep. like uh, this. After